Okay, hi everyone. Hello, Year 12 psychologists. Hope we're all good. Um, really well done with the work that you're doing. You're doing a fantastic job. I'm just going to start by going through the work that was set uh, this week. Um, so you've got some Seneca tasks. Obviously, submit the work as normal uh, on the Teams channel. Um, we're going to be looking at the biological approach to explaining OCD. And last week, you were looking at the emotional, behavioural and cognitive characteristics, which we're going to go through as well. So the video <clears throat> we'll be going through last week's and this week's work um, all together, so it ties in nicely. Um, before getting stuck into this video, you would have done um, the textbook reading as well as the kind of reading and annotating and completing of pages 28 and 29 of your booklet. And also do have a go at these, these questions here. Um, you might want to look at this video before you do these questions to give you a bit more guidance. Um, and if you want to send any of the answers for any sort of individual feedback as well, I'm more than happy to do so. But I will be setting some um, questions next week based on the evaluation, which is more difficult, um, and giving you some proper individual feedback on assignments there as well. I've got some optional tasks as well uh, to complete some further research. You know, are there any other genes implicated? Uh, we're looking at the Compton the search gene here, but you know that um, lots of these disorders can be polygenetic in terms of their um, causes. So can you find the other genes? I'd be interested to hear about those. Um, and we can discuss that, of course, in our Q&A, uh, which we're going to stick to um, for this Friday. Um, I will be in school every Friday now from this Friday. You would have got details about that. Um, but we'll still run the Q&A at 10 a.m. because we're still, whether you're at home or whether you're coming in, you're still going to be able to dial into that, hopefully, and we'll see how we get on with that. We might have to change it, but we'll see how we go. So let's get stuck into this week's lesson then, looking at OCD. And of course, OCD is a complex disorder. Um, you would have sort of grasped that uh, from the work last week of various um, symptoms. And I just wanted to pick up on this idea of how, how we use this, this phrase, because we often, um, you know, in our kind of everyday language, say things like, oh, I'm sorry, see OCD about that. And I kind of want to pick up on that because um, it's really important that we as psychologists and you know, we recognise that OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is a clinical diagnosis. It is a disorder. So we really, as we should be, not be using that term uh, too flippantly because it is a debilitating disorder and it can affect people with it quite quite uh, profoundly. Um, so as we get to know about this, we'll get an appreciation for that. Uh, we'll be kind of picking apart this this cycle. This idea of having an obsessive thought, which is the cognitive aspect, leading to an emotional aspect of the anxiety, and then a compulsive behaviour, um, <clears throat> which is our behaviour aspect of, of, the, of the disorder, and then we get this temporary uh, relief of someone with OCD. And we're going to pick this apart um, and, and really think about this in relation to the symptoms. Um, and today, obviously, we're going to be looking at a biological explanation for this. So last week, you would have looked at um, the behavioural, emotional and cognitive characteristics. I'm going to go through those a little bit and give you some extra material um, to have a look at as well. Um, then we're going to go through the biological approach, looking at specifically genetic component and the neural explanation there. And we need to know that both of these in detail, because in the exam, you can be asked specifically about genetics, specifically about neural, or you can have a more general question um, describing the biological approach, which you could refer to either or or both. So you need to know both in detail. Um, next week, then, we'll evaluate that um, uh, explanation, and that's when I'll be setting you some more questions um, around that. So first of all, let's think about what OCD actually is. Um, and I'm going to just um, highlight some symptoms that I want you to have a look at um, based on last week's work and think about, is it cognitive, emotional or behavioural? And so let's just have a quick look. OK, so here we go. This is um, some of these are from the textbook. Some of them are additional. So I just want you to have a look at these, have a read through these. <clears throat> and they've all been sort of jumbled up, um, similar to what you've got in the textbook and your booklets by now. But I want you to have, pause the video, have a read of each of these. And can you um, identify them as either emotional, cognitive or behavioural? So just pause the video, have a read and see if you're able to identify them based on the work that you've done from last week. Okay, so here we go. These are kind of organized uh, into their different categories. Um, 
and we'll just pick up on a couple but you can you can check these and have a read through these and you might want to um, have your booklet in front of you now and just check you know have I got these written down accurately are there any additions that I can include anything that's missing and add those into your into your notes So one of the key kind of emotional aspects here, as we said, is, is anxiety. Anxiety levels um, are high and they prevent the individual from conducting meaningful uh, social relations. It can have all sorts of effects. But the, the main component here for, for the emotional aspect is this idea um, of the anxiety. Okay. In terms of our cognitive aspect, then the um, key cognitive aspect is the compulsion. Okay, so, uh, so the, the obsession, the obsession is the cognitive compo component um, leading to those behaviours. So do have a check of those, make sure they're all correct, and you can add to your notes um, where needed. So in terms of our biological approach, okay, this suggests that. Our behaviour is a result of our, our physiological processes, and this is kind of um, the kind of key assumption, really, of the biological approach. Um, that behaviours uh, can be explained through physiological processes within our makeup, within our biological makeup. We're going to look specifically at genetics and the neural aspect, and we need to also be familiar with research that kind of backs this up. And you'll see the detail in your booklets of the research, and that's that can always add to a, a six-mark descriptive answer. I'm going to focus mainly on the on the, the actual processes themselves uh, in this uh, video. What do we mean by genetics then? How could we test to find out whether OCD is caused by genetics? Um, I want you to pause the video now and, and consider those two questions. Of course, when we're thinking about genetics, we're thinking about our genetic makeup. What is it about our genetic makeup that may lead to an increased probability that that person, that individual, holding those specific genes um, whether they're gene variants like the Compton search gene that then leads to the kind of outward expression of those genes as a, as a, as a phenotype, which are called a phenotype, those you do biologists, as OCD. That's what we're interested in. How can we test this? Well, if we're looking specifically at genetic component, we need to be able to design research and studies that are able to separate out genetic and environmental influences, which can be really, really difficult. Okay, but some of the key studies key types of studies that we'll look at as psychologists are twin studies, particularly looking at um, the difference between monozygotic and dizygotic twins, which we'll pick up in a minute. Um, adoption studies as well, trying to separate out the biology from the environmental influences, as well as um, looking at family studies and looking at the kind of um, concordance rates and propensity of, of OCD within the family um, and seeing if there's a genetic link there. So just to pick up on this idea of, uh, of types of twins, okay, so DZ twins are uh, dizygotic, okay, so dizygotic twins um, refers to those biologists, two zygotes, so that's two um, separately fertilised eggs by two separate sperm, which provide two separate embryos, and therefore what we'd also refer to as fraternal twins because they share the same amount of DNA as a quote-unquote normal brother or sister or sister and sister, right? Um, because of the separate egg and the separate sperm. Dizygotic, meaning two zygotes. Monozygotic twins then are, are identical twins, also referred to as MZ twins, monozygotic. And we refer to that, in, in terms of the biology behind that, as we have one egg <clears throat> that's fertilised by one sperm, and in order to, to form identical monozygotic twins, the embryo at a very early stage will separate, and from there, two, two um, uh, babies are, are grown from those two separate embryos. They, have, they share 100% of their genes, whereas dizygotic twins or fraternal twins share half their DNA, okay, as a normal brother, sister, 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 etc., would.
And here we go, just found the pictorial form. Um, monozygotic or diazog uh, identical twins and diazygotic non-identical twins. Okay. And what we're interested in is, what is the probability that if one twin has the disorder, has OCD, is clinically diagnosed with OCD, what is the probability that the other twin will also have it? And so we refer to this as a concordance rate, which is often expressed as a percentage, okay? as a probability. And it's important that we you know what's the propensity, the probability that will happen. So if one twin has the disorder, does the other twin have the disorder? Is it a it is a measure of genetic similarity. Concordance rates for OCD tend to be higher in MZ twins. And what does this suggest? Well, we can pause the video and have a think. Now, of course, because MZ twins share 100% of their genetics, if OCD has a genetic component, you would expect to see much higher concordance rates in monozygotic twins, identical twins, compared to diazygotic twins. And you'll see from the booklet, you'll see from the research and the reading that you've done, that does tend to be the case. However, it's not 100% for the monozygotic twins. In other words, if one twin is diagnosed with OCD, we don't see a 100% concordance rate with every other twin, every twin of the, of the monozygotic pair also having OCD. Okay, it's slightly lower. And then we can start to think about, well, what does that tell us? It tells us that Yes, there must be a genetic component because there's a higher concordance rate for monozygotic twins compared to DZ twins. There must be a genetic component, but it's not 100% genetics. And that's important that we have that going forward and we can use that as part of our evaluation as well um, of this explanation. So from the booklet reading, you would have seen that there's um, specific genes implicated in the uh, cause of um, OCD, but it, it's you know, a polygenic or polygenetic um, polygenic explanation in as much as there's going to be a group of genes that are responsible. And it may not be just these two genes that we're looking at, it could be more, but these ones that have been implicated and uh, researched more. So the comp gene <coughs> is involved in the production of dopamine, and we often see um, that this variant <coughs> can lead to higher levels of dopamine. Okay, and uh, Dopamine is a reward uh, neurotransmitter, um, and affects reward pathways in the brain and we'll see in a minute how this reward so increased higher levels of dopamine therefore higher reward can link into that cycle that we looked at at the very beginning of this powerpoint and we'll pick this apart in a minute you'll see evidence for that as well in, in, in the booklet as well as evidence for the cert gene uh, relating to serotonin serotonin um, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has an in inhibitory and kind of regulating effect on our mood. Okay, um, in normal levels of serotonin, we are able to regulate our mood, and we'll explain this in a bit more detail about how that ties in with OCD symptoms. Um, a variant of this gene, if you have a variant of this gene, a specific variant, variant of this gene, um, it can lead to lower levels of serotonin, which we know can then explain some of the symptoms for OCD. So first of all, let's pick apart about what, what a neurotransmitter actually is. Okay, so a neurotransmitter is a chemical messenger, okay, um, and it modulates signals within the neuron. And when we look at biopsychology, which is our next new big topic we're doing after psychopathology, we'll be learning all about the, the processes behind the synaptic transmission. But what you've got here is just a zoomed in kind of a uh, picture, I guess, of, of, of a synapse, the gap between two neurons. Um, and we can see there that a neurotransmitter, in this case, it could be serotonin or dopamine, diffuses across that synapse, binds to um, specific postsynaptic receptor sites and has its effect okay, on that neural pathway. We know that serotonin um, is an inhibitory neurotransmitter, dopamine is a reward neurotransmitter. And so we see, often see in OCD patients that um, serotonin is in lower levels, okay, having less less of an inhibitory effect on mood, and dopamine uh, in higher levels, so higher levels of reward. And we'll pick up on this um, in a minute. But we need to know that neurotransmitters um, are just a chemical messenger. Now we often pick up on this. There's often a misconception around the difference between hormones and neurotransmitters. 
and it's good just to pick up on this because <clears throat> serotonin and dopamine aren't hormones okay um, hormones are produced by glands and those hormones are secreted in the blood and that's how hormones get around um, our body through um, transportation in the blood okay they then have their effect on a target organ so for example adrenaline um, is a hormone okay it's produced by the adrenal glands it's secreted into the blood uh, bloodstream and then has its effect for example on the heart in the fight or flight response to pump that to, to increase heart rate to pump the blood around and have its various effects so hormones travel in the blood whereas neurotransmitters are secreted by vesicles in the neurons themselves the nerve cells themselves okay um, and that's the key difference between neurotransmitters and hormones both chemical messengers but both uh, but but travel and have their effect in different ways so it's important to pick up on that as well so you do add that to your notes now if we take um just have, take a bit of time to have a look at the kind of pathways um, that are in the brain and you don't need to learn all the intricate details here but the detail that's in your um in your booklet is, is kind of the fundamentals and i just want to pick up on a couple of ideas here so first of all we need to think about the compulsions the comp compulsions that we may have become rewarding as they stop the obsession um happening okay if we just nip back to the beginning of the powerpoint we looked at that sorry just a sec this pathway here we have an obsessive thought that's the cognitive aspect which produces the emotional aspect of anxiety which leads to compulsive behavior so this is what we're trying to explain here and we can link this to the neurotransmitters and um, what's going on in the brain so let's just go back to that so remember the compulsion is the behavior okay and that behavior can be um, become rewarding and stop the obsessions happening temporarily okay so that's talking about here the dopamine pathway right now if we let's take one example okay so let's say for example someone has uh, an obsession an obsessive thought that the house is going to burn down okay it's, it, you know it's, it's a often quite actually quite a common one um, that can lead to high levels of anxiety and then the um, compulsion might be to check everything in the house turn off all the switches um, obsessively okay to then alleviate that now in OCD patients if someone has low um, serotonin levels that can increase the levels of anxiety due to those obsessions so whereas ordinarily we would you know we might get worried about the safety of our house not necessarily burning down ordinarily people quote unquote normal people would be able to dismiss that um thought and we are oh, don't see that's fine someone who's suffering with ocd and has lower levels of serotonin will struggle to regulate that thought okay and that will lead to higher levels of anxiety and the obsession becoming quite you know emotionally um, driven right and so low levels of serotonin can explain those high levels of anxiety that are caused by those obsessions if we then couple that with the higher levels of dopamine when the compulsion is then carried out that behavior aspect going around the house checking everything and switching things off the reward can then become higher okay and we not so higher levels of anxiety but higher level reward on the compulsive behavior and that can then in itself, itself then lead to this cycle of those obsessive compulsive um, behaviors so bringing that together if we have low levels of serotonin that can lead to higher levels of anxiety around that obsessive thought okay whether that's you know the house burning down or the oven catching light or whatever it may be lower serotonin levels in patients can lead to higher levels of anxiety okay and that will then lead to the compulsive behavior so going around the house and switching off everything and checking everything um, because of that obsessive thought and the high levels of anxiety which will then lead to temporary relief okay but if the patient has high levels of dopamine that temporary relief brings a much higher level of reward and so the cycle then completes 
high levels of anxiety due to the low levels of, of um, serotonin, leading to that compulsive behaviour. But the compulsive behaviour now, due to the high levels of dopamine, is much more rewarding. And so it almost um, reinforces that obsessive compulsive loop. So that's the kind of um, the neural aspect involving the neurotransmitters. We can have a, a little look at the um, Oh, sorry, the second part of the neural um, explanation. So we've looked at neurotransmitters specifically, but we can also look at specific brain areas as well. And you've got some detail in here about the, the RFC, which is the orbitofrontal cortex, which, uh, and, and the thalamus that, that helps to regulate these kind of worrying thoughts. Okay, so normally, RFC sends a sing signal to the thalamus about anything that is worrying us. That happens on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, we um, engage in our... Um, normal activities will have these kind of worrying thoughts and that happens all the time we, you know we have these kind of worrying thoughts all the time and the OFC's job then is to signal to the thalamus going right what do we need to do about this is this something we should actually worry about or is it fine and we can just deal with that and in someone who's not suffering from OCD they're able to process these worrying thoughts rationalize them and move on now the chordate nucleus normally suppresses okay normally suppresses signals from the OFC if you know those worries aren't really legitimate based on communicating with the thalamus which is also linked to kind of things like memory as well so if there is any damage to the chordate nucleus those minor worries that we may have um, are not stopped from from altering and entering the thalamus okay so not stopped from alerting the thalamus okay so if there is any damage to the chordate nucleus the minor worries that we have are not stopped from alerting the thalamus. This then leads to, okay, performing the behaviours to stop this worry circuit that has been activated. And so, in a nutshell, what we have here is in kind of normal, if we say in quotes, normal people will have these worrying thoughts, it will go into this worry circuit from the OFC, chordate nucleus and the thalamus, and we can process them, we can suppress them, no worries. If there is damage to the specific part, the chordate nucleus, the worries are not stopped from going to the thalamus. And so what we have then is this kind of almost irrational kind of um, alerting, almost a rational worry circuit, which kind of explains um, the OCD and the obsessive compulsive behaviours. So I'll just pause the video at that point and have, a, have another read through these three um, steps and what that leads to. Um, and add in any further detail um, to your notes in your booklet. So we've done the reading already. Um, this is kind of an optional task, okay, if you'd like to do this, uh, to produce a diagram that summarises each of the following in, in terms of influencing the onset of OCD, genetics, neurotransmitters and brain function. Okay. So, if you want to do this optional task, if you'd like to do some drawing, I'm a big fan of the drawing as you know, um, you might want to do this um, optional activity to try and bring this into a more pictorial form um, to then bring these three explanations together. And of course, these, the genetics is one explanation, neurotransmitter and brain function both relate to the neural aspect. Okay? So within, you've got genetics and neural, and within neural you've got neurotransmitters and brain function. Okay, so if you want to pause the video, go back through um, what we've said here, what we've covered, compare this video and, and what I've gone through to the notes that you've got in your, in your booklet, and then also have a go at this optional task if you'd like, and then do those exam questions um, that I've set for you. Again, as I said at the beginning, if you'd like some extra feedback or some individual feedback on those, um, those specific exam questions, do let me know, do send them over, and I'll give you some individual feedback. Okay, hope that's helped and clarify a few bits and pieces, um, and look forward to chatting to you guys on Teams. Okay, thanks very much.